This is the Permaculture Podcast. I'm Scott Mann. Today I'm joined by my friend Joshua Hughes as he shares the continued work of the team he's a part of to create a jungle-to-marketplace supply chain with the launch of Rewild Organics. Starting with farms like Verde Energia and surrounding neighbors, and the protection and investment of black sheep regenerative resource management, the umbrella of Rewild Organics provides cooperative ownership and collaboration for farmers, farm partners, and suppliers along the way. As these organizations put the final pieces in place to this logistical network, they're bringing the first line of turmeric products to the marketplace in cooperation with farmers of the United States, continuing the spirit of partnership and collaboration. As Joshua and I try to release an update on this process every year or so, and continue the conversation off-air throughout that time, we begin our discussion with a formal introduction to Rewild Organics, the announcement of a giveaway, and then slip into a more casual talk about how this integrated, equitable, and regenerative vision is coming to fruition after nearly 15 years in the making. Enjoy this conversation with Joshua, and I'll join you again after. Then Joshua, as we get started, over the years we've had a lot of conversations about your work in the jungles of Costa Rica with Verde Energia and what you're doing to grow and build farms and helping your neighbors. We then moved on last year. I got to meet with you and Amanda in person outside of Washington, D.C., where we talked about what you were doing to kind of expand black sheep, regenerative resource management into the world. And you were talking then about how you're bringing hundreds of thousands of pounds of turmeric from the jungle into the global north in order to bring these products to market so that you can then return some of that wealth and capital to the farms in Costa Rica and to your other partners. And as I understand, you've now launched Rewild Organics as kind of like this brand to bring all these products to the marketplace. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about what those products are and also to share about this giveaway that you've offered to the audience of the Permaculture Podcast. Hey, Scott. Yeah, turmeric has played a major role in our agroforestry practices in our Costa Rican farms. And that works out perfectly up here because the value added products that we can make from it are in high demand in the north. People really benefit from fresh products and fresh turmeric in their diets, but they can also benefit from the extracted nutrients, the curcumin, the tumorones, which are like the oleo resins and the essential oils. So we get to take about two to six percent of the plant, and send it to the U.S. And then up here we can blend it with other goods, other farm goods and make value added products. In doing so, uh, our network in Costa Rica gets to do much better. Our farms get to sell to an in-network demand and make five to eight X per kilo in their product. We're gonna be sending our first shipments of product to the US in just a short few months. We're processing our goods in about a week. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of kilos of turmeric coming off our farms and the co-op farms in our region. And we'll be doing the value adding of those now and, and in the years to come. Rewild Organics is our first expression to the market up here. We launched in November with our first two products, a, a turmeric essential oil and a turmeric curcumin black pepper tincture with ingredients sourced from our farms and from other organic farms around the world right now to test the markets and lay the foundation as we prepared our own crops and we prepare to sell them up here and around the world. After 14 plus years of developing the regenerative supply chain, we're finally preparing to put the last pieces of this puzzle in place. It's a true full spectrum permaculture from the farm to the face, as I like to put it. And we're, we're offering now a giveaway of this first product. We're offering 50 bottles of the turmeric black pepper tincture to uh, your your listeners and our family out there. You may have heard the black pepper increases the bioavailability, bioavailability of turmeric, and that's why we've included it in this blend. So we're happy to offer this to your listeners, and we're happy to be giving away these 50 bottles and excited to hear how people feel about it. What are the ways that you use this or that your customers are using these kinds of products in their lives? Well, this is our first product. So this is more like a you drip it into your mouth. It's got a distinct flavor. People might drip this into their smoothies or something. The essential oils go on the skin, but this goes in the mouth. So we have other products coming soon. We're going to have a fortified turmeric powder very soon so people can use it more in cooking. It's going to be a turmeric powder enhanced with extra curcumin. We have a pill coming soon so people that really can't read those bottles or, or count the drops have an opportunity to take this. There's going to be a lot of ways we get this into the body. But this tincture is the most effective way we could, we could roll this product out. It's simple. It tastes nice. And uh, it absorbs well going in, into the mouth. If you can absorb it before it goes down the esophagus and down into the stomach, it's good. You're going to get a higher, higher absorption. So that's why we okay. made this tincture at first. But we're going to follow this product up with more ingredients for the kitchen. We're going to have fortified powder in a few weeks. We're going to be doing uh, R&D on that. So. And for anybody who wants to find that, they can go to rewildorganics.org? Rewildorganics.org is live. Yep, that's our website. And soon we'll be available on Amazon and a bunch of other websites. But we're, we're rolling out now on our day. And then for anybody who does want to enter this giveaway, just go ahead and send an email to show at the permaculturepodcast.com with the subject turmeric, 
And then I'll add you to the list. As I say, the first 50 people who respond to this will get a bottle of the Rewild Organics Turmeric Tincture. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to get people out there taking our products. Many years in the in the making, and this collaboration from our farms and the farms all around the world, frankly, is is something that's uh, it's been a dream of all of ours, and it's a way of bringing farmers into the the full spectrum of this game. So we're not we're not left behind, and we're not leaving people behind. Real quick before we get to the rest of the conversation. In setting up this giveaway, I'll need to pass along your name, email, and mailing address to the team so they can get in touch if need be and get a bottle of tincture in the mail to you. Also, for the folks who aren't among the first 50, they'd like to offer you a 30% discount code on a future purchase. If you're still comfortable with me passing your email address along, feel free to enter or let me know if you only want me to share your information if you're one of the first 50. So Joshua, with your launch of Rewild Organics and spending all this time in the States again, how is it to experience winter in the Pacific Northwest after so long in Costa Rica? <laughs> I've never, I haven't been, okay. I went into like Price Mart, which is kind of like the Costco in Costa Rica. And I went into the mm-hmm. milk area and that was the coldest I'd been in 14 <laughs> years. So yeah, I know I, I, I was, I was back here last winter. I was supposed to be here just for like the beginning of last winter and head back to Costa when COVID happened. I thought I'd get like maybe a half a winter in, but I got a little bit last year. But uh, this year, I, I'm like not on the road. Last year, when winter was here, I was in Southern California and out driving around where it's a little sunnier. But being in Oregon now um, and spending a, a December and now a January coming up, it's going to be cold. Um, and we we have our our products all just showed up from the co-packers and we're doing our first distributions of products out to the world. So we built an office and distribution center in the garage here. So I'm uh, I'm sitting in front of a propane heater trying not to freeze to death. I really kind of thought I'd never do a winter again anywhere cold, or if I thought I thought I would, I thought it would be, you know, on a snowboard only, but now I'm committed to working, working up here for a while, getting, getting all these lovely things off the farm and out to the world. In about three weeks, we pick up or we, we harvest and deliver to the processor and process about 200,000 pounds of turmeric off, the, off the three farms. So it's got to get up here to the market and get, get all handled and everything all the way to the packaging and out to the Amazon world. So, you know, yeah. Farmer's job is never done. If you're not harvesting, you're planting. If you're not planting, you're planting. If you're not planting, you're managing your fields. Yeah, and once you get all that done and you've accomplished something, do you do you just sell it to the world market and make almost nothing, or do you try to reach up the value chain or try to you know value add it if you can? And as you know, we've talked about this over the years. It's what we've been working on is how to how to do that full spectrum thing so farmers can actually participate in the gains and the wins that happen in the food world. Um, there's plenty of gains in the food world, just not a lot of it getting to the farmers, especially in the, and I do big quote unquote developing world or whatever, Central America. Um, yeah. Not a lot is left for the, or not a lot is left on the land for the, not just the farmer's family, but for the things that we all need out of farms, which is the regenerative twist, and all the things we'd hope for. So it's been an adventure, but I'm sitting here in front of you know hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of inventory that's been value added and people love it. And it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to be a part of this, even though it's, it's a little cold and I'm not getting to wake up in the jungle every day. I don't know, this year sort of is its own kind of jungle in the U.S., right? I, uh, I spent my summer doing business and resisting Donald Trump. So it's, it's been an interesting year. <laughs> anyway, I've been yeah. in sort of jungle, but I'm, I'm ready to be back in the forest, honestly, and get back to the work. We've done a lot of the the nuts and bolts of permaculture business the last two years. And now that a lot of that's been built kind of an automatic now, or we've hired employees to, to run those things, I get to, I get to head back and start doing forestry again in this, this next year. So that's exciting. From the things we've talked about over the years, what I like about what's been coming out of those is because in the Western world and really the world at large is the more that we kind of have inequality taking place. It's not a race to the top anymore. We're not trying to lift everyone else's boats. It's really a race to a bottom just to make sure that everybody has a boat. And, yeah. you know, doing this value add and the work that you've been doing to return resources back to the jungle really does help elevate your community and give assistance to people who aren't going to have access to things like crop insurance or all of these yeah. other pieces that bolster Western agriculture while still leaving a lot of people in the dust. You know, I think about many of our friends who are doing forest farming and permaculture practices and a lot of people engaged in regenerative agriculture, they don't have access to crop insurance. You know, that's something that's really reserved for like commodity farmers. And it's been interesting following a local agriculture reporter here in D.C. has been really digging into those kinds of numbers where, you know, your commodity farmers, often those farm families are, are millionaires and, you know, have 
millions of dollars in assets. But when you look at the people who are really trying to do this work in a meaningful way on small holdings, they're the ones who are trying to scrape by on thirty or forty thousand dollars a year gross while having a family and everything else that goes with it. When you try and take a risk as a small farmer, the the bank doesn't know how to do it if it's not insurable. Like you said, it's been a challenge. And we're doing things that are the way we have to insure our crops on this level is a bunch. It's a bunch different. We insure it by diversity. I insure it by polycultures on the farm. That you have to think about it differently. And insure it like I have a turmeric crop, but I also have turmeric co-ops and networks throughout the whole country of Costa Rica, so I can fall back on if I do have a failure. I don't want it to cascade through the whole supply chain as nobody wants. It, it is a different kind of insurance we're building in, and it's a different kind of risk management. And there will be those crops that do fit into that model. But when you are value adding a good, it's, the insurance is be- it's better than having insurance to be a part of the, the retail good. That's the kind of insurance I like. And then the, the value adding we do is a way of preserving crops and, and uh, getting them shelf stable. That helps, that helps on another side too, where we're, we're really directly involved in that. Like we're investing right now in, in equipment uh, for farms and in processing systems for the co-ops and the networks. And the closer that is to the farm, the less spoilage the farm has, the less, the, the less risk they take there. So it's tough not being able to go and play with the big boys and girls out there, but we're not, we don't have a level playing field here. But if you choose to get engaged in the supply chain differently, there's a different kind of insurance. It's the same kind of insurance we talk about all the time in permaculture world, community, nature. You know, I'm, I'm falling onto a lot of those things. I insure my soil by planting diversity and having trees that help feedback loops and build nitrogen, or f- fix nitrogen for me so that my next year's crop is healthier. I, I don't have the same problems with disease at scale because I don't do monoculture. So, you know, it, it, it's a different risk management in this world. Yeah, and I think about this kind of soil-based investing. It's something that Ben Falk wrote about, you know, about 10 years ago at this point. You know, do you put $20 into the stock market or do you put $20 into a fruit tree that will begin paying you in a few years and in the end likely provide more food over that tree's lifetime, not counting seeds and what else you might be able to do from it, than just that single financial investment in the markets and the way that we can create, you know, these polycultures within our entire view and outlook in the world. Well, we learned this this year, 2020 was a powerful lesson, especially, I mean, if you're in the food industry at all, uh, about the lack of resiliency, we, you know, in Costa Rica, having some of the funnels and the, and the, the, the spots where we, we, couldn't succeed with, with everything being closed. There weren't labs open. Universities are where the labs are in Costa Rica to test, test crops that are going to be exported. These bottlenecks that this year showed to us, like destroyed the food industry. And it happened last spring, right? We had a tr- tremendous failing between the plantings that didn't happen and the crops and animal husbandry all went to shit because our food system isn't built, built right. It's built for just the, the large systems. It's not really built to be resilient. So uh, this year, it's been an interesting time to talk about all these things. As, after many years of most, both of us being in the trenches trying to bring or shed light onto this, I couldn't have, we couldn't have made this kind of impact on people's hearts and minds. COVID has laid bare our problems in a lot of ways and the food industry specifically. So this, this year has been a, a great time to reset in Costa Rica specifically. Tourism has been a big thing to keep the country alive, to keep it thriving, to keep the projects that frankly call themselves farms, but aren't really uh, alive and growing and to keep the whole green education system going. That all kind of came to a sudden halt too. So there's been a really deep reflection this year down to the smallest farmer, smallest holder. How can we participate? How can we get through this kind of ups and down? And maybe we weren't used to this. This hasn't happened for generations, this kind of disruption, worldwide disruption. But this has proven to me that there's a need more than ever for like that Grange and co-op level infrastructure. And that that's where we can put some investment right now that will make sure that fruit tree you plant has a place to be processed. So it isn't just fruit on the ground at this, on the sidewalk that maybe is too much for one family to deal with, right? So thinking, thinking a little bigger and a little smaller at the same time, I think is gonna be a valuable part of at least of my lesson this last year is to lean in harder and harder on, on the infrastructure we need so that your fruit tree matters in the whole supply chain more. You know, it's hard to just can food with your family. We did this in my family as I grew up, but there was like a month, month and a half a year where we were dedicated to preserving food and that's not something most people can do, especially if they're trading their time for money. It's an interesting thing. And we, we at Verde Energia, we, and we experimented with a lot of these things that are at the farm, hundreds of ideas. And how do, you, how do you have that fruit tree in the front yard and make it work, not just be you know, 99% wasted apples and a few fresh ones when I walk by, um, or just a few pies a couple times a year. Like we, We've been trying to integrate all these things. And I think we've kind of found a sweet spot with certain, certain things. And we're going, to keep, uh, we're going to keep pressing and investing in those, those spots so that infrastructure is there for the next time or frankly so this doesn't happen again 
we don't need to fail in the food system. And looking at those systems and the various crops that you have grown on the farms, does that lead you then to look at like what products will be used locally, what will be used regionally, nationally, and internationally? Well, for us down there, we have like a kind of an eternal spring and I have a couple months of dry. So down there, we have a little different thing. We don't have winter. So I, and that's one of the reasons I went down there. I wanted to see what would happen if I, if I got to work with trees in a, in a more year round fashion. So we really leaned into tree, tree culture down there. And as far as local food goes, we're very like our, our neighbors eat well because we've, we've all planted and learned from them how to, how to groove with the trees, the protein, the things like pehivaye and bread nut and uh, breadfruit and jackfruit and these high, produ- high producing fats and proteins that come out of the jungle. This has been another focus of us on a local level. A lot, big problem with the tropics is it's hard to grow. It's hard to get a lot of protein and the, the bigger animals, the cows, they destroy our type of environment down there pretty quickly. So we've been replacing the cattle and the, uh, the other animals, uh, husbandry that's really deforested down there with, with those high protein, high fat things. So that's what we focused on down there so that we could kind of stop one problem with, and the solution from that could be a, a nice feedback loop. But up here, I mean, it's, it's a whole different story in every bioregion, right? So I, I urge people to study what grows in their areas and lean into that too. But again, the infrastructure, the, the equipment needed to do this stuff isn't as simple as uh, what grows and what I want to do. We've, we've focused hard in our, in our bioregion to invest in the co-op level co-op level for a reason it's a lot of this stuff can't be done alone right it's really got to be done with community and it's not it's a lost art in a lot of ways too food preservation and frankly it's a science that needs to be done right because it's also about community health and part of the reason we're dealing with things like covid is because we haven't respected the food system as much as we should having what i've seen in my life of the the feedlots of the west coast and stuff we're, we're destined to keep creating super viruses and stuff so as as a community all the way down to my farm we we have to think again bigger and smaller we need to we need to be safe in the way we act and we need to invest in it properly my answer there is always it seems to be pretty broad it matters where people live more than my ideas but where we're at we've leaned in hard to try and stop deforestation through the best plants possible and the the reason it's being done down there happens to be for protein so that's what we've chose and some of the byproducts of those protein-rich trees, those protein and fat-rich tree crops, are cover crops like turmeric or crops that grow on the ground in these polycultures that are, that are superfoods and highly valued if you can be a part of the value chain in that as well. So we've leaned in on those local crops that integrate well with the one or two or three or 10 things that we can participate in in those larger scale, more farm-like things. Um, so our farms are complementing our local gardens and vice versa. And looking at our food system and the infrastructure that's involved and you building up both Black Sheep and Verdernahia and your current work with turmeric and value-added products, what are some of the things that you see currently and on the horizon for places that permaculture practitioners and other people who are interested in regenerative agriculture can be making some of these investments in the infrastructure and what we need collectively to move forward? Well, you know, there's a ton of systems to integrate. I spent half my morning on the phone this morning with people that are doing really well thought through and actually quantifiable ways to do things like carbon capture. So try, it's, it's, it's not going to be as, uh, as simple, but it's going to be a little easier because of all these other integrated steps that we can take in the long run. But, but I would say that we need to invest in co-op level agricultural value adding like we've done. <clears throat> we started a farm, we started a project and we didn't know what we didn't need yet. We listened to our community, again, not knowing what we didn't need. I moved to Central America to a community I was totally foreign to, had to learn how to even listen uh, in the language. So I took a lot, I took very slow steps. It took me 14 years to develop a program that got me to the point where we're at. Like if this wasn't something you can invest in overnight. So I invested in my community and then I invested in the things that my community loved. That's the broadest strokes you can paint to like get people to actually engage and move some of the money that's sitting in their bank doing nasty things. Like me as a, as a liberal activist in the yesteryear, I would earn money at my job. And then I would, I would go sign petitions at Saturday markets and give a few bucks here and there and donate to help people. But my savings account was really aggressively mining in the Congo to get its 3% or whatever it was getting at the time. And I, I, had, to, I had to reflect on that deeply. I had to look at my own life and do an audit about where I was making and saving and storing wealth in my own life. And when I did that, I sort of started going a little stir crazy about how much I was participating in the things I didn't enjoy, enjoy or agree with. So I, I got very active in my own finance and my own plans and my long-term, short-term, medium-term, the way I thought about money and wealth. The big answer, again, being a permaculturist, you know, it's always one answer leads to another question. 
but at, at the small level, I started living simply and I started figuring out where I needed to invest. And I did kind of a radical thing. I jumped off grid with, you know, a couple hundred friends and, and did what a lot of us t- do, you know, probably dream about when we're at a festival or something with our buddies. <laughs> um, we really did commit to doing that. And what I found is it's a bunch of simple answers. It wasn't the extreme things that did the most. So I've, I'm, I'm investing in the simplest spots. I'm investing in what my community loves. It started with the water. It started with the forest, it started with the animals. It circled out from there. But in the, at the base of it, we did buy a farm and we knew we'd be involved in food creation. And most of us weren't farmers. I've been very open and invested in the young people with with good ideas and good training. I've, I've, I've invested a lot of time and money, whether that be in the form of scholarships or just having an open source space where people can come and live into young scientists, into people who, who are normally gonna kind of go into the Fortune 500 world and get their jobs after school. I've taken time to invest in that and build serious relationships there because I think they, they're gonna have the ideas that are actually gonna change this. I'm 43 now, I'm not too old, but I'm gray. And I'm, I'm leaning in now as hard as I can into the 20 somethings and I'm getting them the opportunities I can. So we've chosen to make all our projects very open source in the way that they're owned as well. So Black Sheep and Verde owned in whole by now, maybe we're owned by 140 people total, our seven little projects. And we're going to keep pushing that diverse and broad ownership model because then decisions can be made and choices can be made that aren't just me and Sarah and Amanda's brainchilds and a couple of people at our farm, but that dynamically grow and evolve with the new up and coming people. That, that Verde has really thrived. My main farm, Verde Energia, has thrived because it's been open and evolving and an open and evolving community it hasn't just been this solid constitution I wrote 15 years ago. So we, we know as a permaculturist, I really learned to, to learn from my processes. And we did this in a way that was debt free. So we've had this luxury. I don't envy what a farmer who already owes $5 million for big equipment and stuff has to do to change what they're going to do. That's going to be a deep long-term plan and reflection. <laughs> but as we came to this as activists and we came to this as foresters, and as animal lovers, you know, it integrated pretty easily into our systems because we didn't come to it with a bunch of preconceived notions and a bunch of heavy debt and burdens to already serve it. So, so I, I do have a, that luxury when speaking on this. Um, I, like I said, we were here up here in Oregon now trying to help farms transition much different bear. And what they need is real money. We need, we need people that aren't just green thumbs to show up at permaculture, uh, in, into the permaculture scene. We, need, we really need more lawyers to show up. I really need more finance people and accountants and people that really care to use their, those arts to help leverage what the places like us and the similar projects all around the world have been learning and, and help us leverage them right now. Because most of the people that are best good at what I do or good at what we do in our team aren't the best at some of those other places. And we're not either. I'm, you know, I don't come from venture capitalist background. And when I sit in those meetings, frankly, it's mostly disappointing because uh, there's, a, there's a lack of understanding on all sides. So I, I, would, I would hope that permaculture gets a resurgence now and that we all push this into a much broader community that brings in those financial people, that brings in the legal minds and the science minds that we need right now. It's not rocket science to scale agriculture, right? It's already been done. It's just been done pretty unconsciously in a few ways and in a centralized way. Um, I, we can, with the right money, it's, it's actually pretty, e- what is it, simple, not easy to do this. We're fortunate that over the last decade or so, there are a lot of new models that have emerged about what agriculture can look like on the small scale that yeah. can succeed in places like here I am outside of Washington, D.C., where property is ridiculously expensive, <laughs> yeah. but where partnering with some folks, you know, maybe an hour from here who have some land, people who have some means can make a much bigger difference because someone can operate a market garden that will have a substantial return, that it, but that it looks completely different from commodity agriculture. You know, how do we show that those models are something that people can invest in, make it so that banks are less afraid of making those loans and getting past some of the history in the United States of how land access has been towards people with more privilege of a certain skin color through various policies and how do we break open to anyone who is interested in this and help them do it again, you know, on a different scale in a different way. Yeah, well, you know, there's something we, we've been talking a lot about in our crew this last few months as we've been asked to scale what we're doing and what that even means. Because what you just said, there's like these different levels of scale. We, we, we're thinking on our farm one way, we're thinking in our co-op another way, we're thinking in our international distribution of retail products in a little different way. But when you're going to invest money in a local system there near DC and if the land costs a ton, your model is, like you said, grow a diverse vegetables, uh, superfood things that people can get, get right at their market that can make that farm some money, but you can't grow corn there, right? It's way too expensive per meter. 
to grow something like corn or beans or, or commodity. So we're figuring that out in the forestry thing too right now of being open and not so stubborn with your own mind when you go into a land project or you go into an area to where's best to scale that idea. If you're going to do big forestry projects, you can, even if you're in DC, but maybe that big forestry deal is 300 miles away. Maybe that's, or it's in Michigan or it's in Costa Rica. You have to be okay with being bigger with your ideas and kind of, we're, we're now doing this with our projects. Like the one project's great for a farm, but not good because of the cost per meter for my forestry idea. So now I'm putting a farm right here and 25 miles inland. What, is, what did our, our little lawyer say the other day? T- turmeric doesn't need a view, right? Like I don't need to give it a view of the ocean, but my community does. My mom would like a view. She doesn't want to just you know, stare at the field all the time. So we're, we're learning how to like think bigger and smaller at the same time again doing it where it best fits. And you, you can be involved in a commodity. Maybe that's because your DC farm is also investing in a Nebraska farm um, as its commodity area and affecting that space. You know, we're learning to find the best leverage points when it comes to like the real estate acquisition for what we're thinking about, not just trying to have it all in one spot because you really can't anyway. And by having that patchwork, you also open up this opportunity to more people where they are, not yeah. necessarily having yeah. to come to you or anything like that. That I don't want anyway, right? Like we, we have our little beautiful paradises where there's less people. I don't want a flood of people coming to Costa Rica, Campo. I don't want a flood of people. I'm sure they don't want their culture to change a bunch in Nebraska, but they'd love a reason. I love, love choices and ways to stay home if they do want that. And that's something that we've learned. I learned a lot personally doing the projects in Costa Rica. My ideal situation when I moved down there and creating this idea versus what people really want and meeting them where they're at. And and really just diving in on a piece of land and you yeah, this excited young Permi going out and like thinking I could do everything in one spot. <laughs> it's been laughable, especially when you get experts in and they're like, Hey, you know what you're thinking about? It's not going to work here at all. And if you're, you know, if you're stuck up on that, you could probably go crazy or blo- grow, break up, break yourself trying. And I've learned to not do either and to count on experts and my friends <laughs> and people in my crew. And so we're, we're investing in more places now, which also builds in resiliency for things like weather shift and climate change and all sorts of things. So. Mm -hmm. diversity is good. And with this co-op model, you know, when I think of co-ops, I always think of like mutual aid and some of those community organizations, but not from like a business perspective. What did you go to in order to kind of like build up a cooperative model where there's certain people or companies that you look to, or is this something you've just been kind of building as you go? Well, we started our own, well, I, we looked at some small examples in Portland 20 years ago. We were doing a biodiesel collective ourselves, trying to figure out how to own something together. And we were pushing on the energy sector, trying to get waste turned into biofuels. So we were experimenting there and we had like 10 of us own a project together. And we learned from a few small projects. One specific was a good little coffee shop owned by six or seven people and how they were doing things in a more, not even in a co-op way, but I don't know, it's a corporate co-op, right? We're owning things together and and giving it a shot. And as I kind of backed out of that and, and got into Costa Rica, or we, we shifted our biodiesel focus from the production to the, the farming end once see was possible there, that's evolved into higher value oils. But all that aside, I, I got to Costa Rica and there was a very heavy co-op presence in my region. Even in my kind of depressed region of Puriscal, there's 4,000 members in a co-op there in the Cope Puriscal. And there's another, uh, a Cope Atenas, a large, uh, large coffee co-op that dips into our region. And and the, I saw how it was helping people not just sustain themselves, but build themselves up, build their families up and help pull them out of poverty and get their land into use. And, and but the, even then, it like those, that level of co-op, 4,000 members, it, it's not personal enough. So there's not a lot of, I don't know, the co-op wasn't able to come and pull you up. You had to really show up yourself. So in my area, I could see how the co-op would help the people that were really motivated, but the people who maybe didn't even have a motorcycle to get to town and people who couldn't even get to that level of infrastructure at their, in their family farm to produce something to get involved in the co-op. There's like a missing link between the co-op and the smaller farmer even. So as we spent time out there and just listening and going to meetings and being a part of the, the system out there that was helping rebuild the forests, um, and we got involved in this, in this zone of protection for the scarlet macaw. And the farms there accepted us in as we did forestry. And a gringo is not even allowed to be in the co-op officially. But in the forestry world and the work we put in there and the amount of volunteers that showed up with smiles and the uh, amount of gringos that showed up with real compassion, like 4,000 people showed up at Red Dinner. He had to help with these forestry projects and stuff. So over the years, we just showed up and the co-op showed up for us. And they started giving us grants, like no strings attached grants, just to get things done organically in the compo. They showed up and gave us 250 grand for 40 farms to plant hatrofa to try biodiesel crop. They gave us 
they've given us hundreds and, and or thousands of banana trees of different kinds because they know we, our co-op will commit to organic production. So this has really come out of the organic love and relationships in my region in Costa Rica and the desire for me to like push back and, on a geopolitical level and, uh, and on a, a revolution, the revolutionary in me, which, which even as a business owner wants more people to own the business with me and, and wants it to be more egalitarian and, and, you know, I have a lot of parallel goals in my political mind <laughs> that, that my business is going to help with, not hinder. So I've, you know, I've, I, this all came organically for our group out of all those relationships. I, I wish there was more of a model to show. There's some amazing leaders throughout history that inspired me from the Emma Goldman's and the anarchists of the early 1900s to the farmers of the late 1800s that were pushing large co-ops and a great book called Get Up, Stand Up. If people haven't read it, they should uh, about the co-ops of the late 1800s and the 1890s during depressionary times that, like where people came together and actually it worked. Organizing worked. Now it didn't work enough because we didn't, you know, we had fell short when it came to controlling finances. And, you know, there's always just been a few bankers that could, could stop good ideas, but, but we're in a different time now. We're in a time when we can bypass bankers as cryptocurrency has shown as, as global markets have shown, we can bypass certain regimes now if we choose to by just moving countries. So I've, uh, I've got a lot of hope in that, in the leadership of the past, but I, I didn't have a lot of blueprints to look at for how you integrate like the really small farm, how you integrate the family owned or co-op neighborhood. Cause we're really our first farm bear dinner here. It wasn't really a farm first. It was the little neighborhood that built an agroforestry system. And like, how does that integrate into the greater thing? Well, it needed, it needed two or three more farms in its area to balance out its production and what it needed. It needed more, you know, a little more elevation. It needed more water here, a little more shade to do what it needed to do. So it took some time to figure it out, itself out. But, but the way it clicked in with this community and the way that we interface with like the, the Americans is something that like our co-ops were kind of lacking access to that as well in Costa Rica. So we've, we've chosen to be that conduit that, that connects co-ops to a to serious investment. We've been trying to look, explain this and spending a lot of money explaining regenerative ag to people with, with capital, to hiring accountants and lawyers to come live in with our permaculture farm for years and, and then, quantify this work and help us build out systems that actually work. So this isn't just an activism, but a business that makes sense. This came out of that. I wish, I wish it was as simple as there was this thing I read and I, I worked with this organization. If there was, I would have done this 10 years ago and I probably would have worked a lot less. But Black Sheep is, has, has like filled in those gaps that we needed as farmers, that we needed as activists, and we needed as, inv as investors. And what we've done, we're here to share. Again, I've said this before on your program and I mean it. And a lot of people have followed up with me from your program. And if we've talked before, any listeners out there, call me again, call me back, please. I, I'm busy, but I still love dropping in with people with 15 minute drop-ins on how, what you're up to and how this is working for you. Because we do this for everybody and we're open sourcing all of this. So call me up if you want, I'll send you, an, uh, send you access to our data vault and y'all can dive into our 150 pages of pro forma and business plans that explain all of this down to the end, which has been one of the I guess if you say there's any magic in this, there's, there's a little magic in the fact that we've been willing to take the risk and invest in that, which a lot of small holders can't do. So we're here to share all that now so other holders can. This reminds me of that thought that, you know, in your case, it's only been 15 years to an overnight success and to have all of this. <laughs> I read that. I think it was Marx that said this. It, for some de decades, nothing happens. And then in some weeks, decades happen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> that's, it, you feel that politically at times and you, you'd hope that's true all the time with certain things and then not with others <laughs> but you know re the regenerative ag world the, the permaculture world whatever you want to call this the people with ethics <laughs> out there that have been pushing and loving and hoping nature would win there are paths forward this isn't it's not just a dream anymore and people have retired that didn't care and people are coming in to work for companies it's, it changes those corporations aren't monoliths. They're not there forever. They're different people today than they were yesterday. And this year is a great year. And this next year that's coming, it's going to be a good year to reflect on that. And the amount of change that won't happen with people like Biden in power is going to be another, <laughs> is going to be another gut check for the liberals and the, the leftist of the world to work harder on the bottom at the base of all this, not just on the national politic. 80 million of us showed up and voted for Biden. Most of us did it with our nose plugged, I'm sure. <laughs> I worked hard for the man. I voted green, but it's about those 80 million people that we're hoping that we need to remember that 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 national election is not the, is not anything hardly. All that does is maybe shift the rhetoric a bit for a minute. But it's time to get to work. And the this year I think is going to be really telling in that it wasn't just Trump. Trump wasn't our only problem, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of us have been in the trenches for decades, 
And uh, I don't want the energy that was like change has to come over this last year to stop with the Democrats. So I'm, I'm, I partially came on your show because I want to say I love everyone for voting and showing up. And now we do the work and contact me because we're doing more of this and we're expanding this. And frankly, in the last month or two, things have exploded for us. Um, surviving COVID as a company, as a group, as a team has, it, it means something. Thing. And being around, like, I don't know, just surviving this year has brought people to the table. I, I'm getting investors on the phone every day. I'm getting clients on the phone every day. People that are switching there where they want to buy their ingredients to us. We, we have about 200,000 pounds of turmeric coming out of the ground in four weeks. So if anybody out there needs turmeric, <laughs> please get in touch with us. And our, and our new company, Rewild Organics, just went live, rewildorganics.org. So we have our forward-facing, like customer-facing permaculture products now for the first time. So it's been an exciting, like, last month. While it's also depressing and we're all sitting at home, <laughs> a lot of things are, are cresting right now. And in the regenerative world and in the wellness game, our time has come, I think. So I'm proud of Permies, the world around. Our farm is thriving right now. We, we looked inward and did more in food production this year and less in education. And now our education is showing up in a more dynamic way because it's more about real production. And, and it's, 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 there's, an un, there's an unleashing happening even on our small scale that I'm sure people are feeling everywhere if, if they've set up for this. So don't, don't yeah. be afraid to keep setting up for this. And I can announce this now. We just signed a contract. We had a million dollar investment come in last month uh, to us uh, in equipment and cash to put together the processing facility we need in Costa Rica. And we're now building a, a large regenerative facility for extracting, extracting the ingredients for our products from things like turmeric and doing the high value essential oils and and protein powders and all that stuff. We just had all that invested in us in the last month. So we're having a, having a very good time right now. <laughs> and we're getting to implement and build. And it's, uh, it's exciting times at, down at Verdinner here. So I've got to ask, what do your meetings look like when you're, when you're putting together these ideas of like something to build on? Or is this just some, you know, is this something that you guys sat down and had a conversation and built this intentionally? Or was it the organic growth about seeing the products in the ground and coming to this over a couple of years. So we were doing the products in the, well, it wasn't products, it was plants. Right? Yeah. I was growing plants. And those plants were the ones that helped bring back the forests. And then as we did that, we had hundreds of people coming a year to the farm, to the, and I quote unquote farm, because it really was just kind of horticulture for us in our, in our production. And we were scaling the things I knew one day we'd want in scale when it comes to trees like avocados and jackfruit. You can't do that tomorrow. It's gotta be done three, seven years ahead of time. So. We were planting trees like crazy and then integrating hundreds of different plants in between and underneath those and crawling up them <laughs> to try and see what worked for production. And in the midst of all that, a lot of people that came through our, our land have companies all over the world and turmeric was a demand that came to us. People would come and try our local versions of these things and be like, hey, I want your turmeric, I want your cacao. So it really came from the farms up. And then as, as the ones that the products that the world liked the most or that the world was demanding, things that are coming down the pipeline like moringa or jackfruit like lovely foods like that we're we're a little bit ahead on but but really the market asked for it the market wants turmeric the market wants cacao and as long as you can do some of the value adding along with that you you can succeed so yeah it was really organic and then it came to us organically as well the first larger customers um, and those customers are actually kind of smaller now in the bigger scheme of things but they really motivated us into and, and it helped us build a, a system that showed profitability even at a small scale and then once you had like a picture there, it became apparent that if we just increased this machine to this size, and if we increased, if we went and bought a, you know, we, we went and invested in a facility where we could dry things a little faster, a little more efficiently, then we could have 15 farms do this instead of just two. So, you know, it, and then those economies of scale made it where the next thing was competitive and available to do. It's, it's really been, it's come out of that. And as we got to that like first big step, it became apparent that if you're going to take that first big step, you might as well use that momentum to build yourself into a region-wide co-op because we have the guts to do that. And we have the experience in the, on the farms and we stayed out of debt in a way that, that was attractive to investor types. Investors show up and see that we've done this without leveraging ourselves, without, without giving this all to banks. <laughs> and they, they, it's, it's been, there's, been a, there's been a long-term test there that's proven itself. Um, so now we can develop, now that we have topsoil, I'm now listening to the market for the next 50 plants that people want. I hope to push people in a few directions with some of the plants that work really well in agroforestry. But, you know, some of those plants are still like Sacha Inchi, if you haven't had that. Great thing to help rebuild the forests. Velvet beans, some amazing things I want the markets to love. But educating the markets is no fun. I don't know if you've ever done that, but trying to put out a product and tell people a new product, that's, that's not something a company at our scale can really afford to do. 
But we're here to say that the ingredient scale of our company, Black Sheep, is here to sell ingredients to large producers. We're showing up at those events and those meetings now and listening to those large, larger demand, those larger demand parts of the market and saying, hey, what can we do for mega foods? What we can do for Ga- Gaia herbs and help them a- accomplish a lot of their goals. Just about everything we do on the ground and then through the supply chain reaches and helps other companies reach their uh, SDG goals, the Sustainable Development Goals from the UN. We're hoping that this, like, this black sheep ingredient supply thing, it helps a lot of people meet these revolutionary ideals and goals in a simple and elegant way of just making the supply chain just and giving farms direct access to the customers in a way. So yeah, we're, we're here to listen to the markets, but it came organically. And again, that's probably why we're still here. We weren't just taking a risk on educating the whole market. We weren't uh, just getting into the commodities market and then hoping to get subsidized, right? So I didn't come from farming. So that in a farming background, that was never something I thought about. I thought you had to actually grow food and succeed. I didn't realize farming was a big shell game <laughs> when it gets yeah. to the biggest level. But you know, I don't come from that background. So in, in small businesses, you have to actually succeed. We chose things carefully that worked for us. And now that you're in a place because you didn't leverage to a bank, you can be more directly involved with and responsible to the people who are investing in what it is that you're doing. And yeah. in turn, that also gives you, you know, you're not locked into something for 15 or 20 or 30 years so that if something does come down the line and you know that it's going to take you, you know, three to five years to bring it online for the marketplace, you can pivot in that way. You're not stuck with that commodity crop that you have a combine that will only plant and harvest that product. Right. Yeah. So far, we've chosen to, to use and buy equipment that's very versatile. The stuff that works for turmeric works for like a hundred other crops that I know of right now. The stuff that powders it, dries it. We're investing in that like point where it's pretty similar machines. When you get directly onto the farms, it's another thing. And farms will have some needs that are very expensive one day that need to be right there on that farm, whatever. One of the engineers we're working with now is off, he's going off to New Zealand soon and he's building robots that do, that can handle, can drive down a row between trees, harvest and, or prune trees on both rows and in the middle, make a bed and harvest and or plant that bed. So there's, there's going to be some cool technologies that come in the regenerative world that are going to be expensive, right? So I'm not, I'm not afraid of where those have to be invested in. I understand that's going to lock some people in on ideas for a while. But polyculture ideas, I think, are going to be the more resilient ones. And, and yeah, combine that just works for corn. You're pretty much a corn farmer forever, I think, right? Or, or wheat or whatever. So, yeah, we're, we've designed in polyculture systems. So all the sh- machines we need are very versatile um, so far. At that being said, soon enough, I, you know, there's other industries that we're getting into, things like hemp, that I'm sure will have some very specific things. Costa Rica just uh, legalized all, all cannabinoids, so planting something like 30,000 acres of hemp this year. So a little, little different scale there. But, but yeah, we've, we've chosen to invest in things that are very versatile for a reason. Again, because it comes from the farm up. If this came from like the investors down, it might be pretty specific, but, but we're farmers at heart. Before we draw our conversation to a close. Where is everywhere that that people can find you? We've got rewildorganics.org. I think last time you'd thrown out your email address and phone number. Do you want to offer those again? Sure, sure. My email address is joshua at weareblacksheep.org and uh, or my email address and my phone number is 503-898-2163. And right now we are rolling out our first products. We have, like I said, a couple hundred thousand pounds of tumor coming out of the ground. So we're processing and getting things to the market up here in the States. And I'm also uh, buying a few new farms and we're kind of doing Verdenergia too, a kind of a larger scale neighborhood project in Costa Rica. So we're going and growing down there and I, I'm, I'm reaching out for new, new people that want to join our team. So looking for new, uh, new blood. And I love it. Every time I do a call out on your show, I get probably 50 to 100 amazing phone calls from people all over the spectrum, by the way. And it's, it's been amazing. So I, I'm, I do the shout out with you only, by the way, Scott. I don't do this to other <laughs> podcasts because I, I, love, I love the Permaculture Podcast and I love our community here where we meet and talk. Yeah. What I love last time, Amanda, joking with us about how it's like, I'm just so glad he was able to sit down and talk with you again because he just won't stop talking about needing to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, you know, it's a slow thing to, to, to talk revolution with just the same 50 people or 10 people in your community. And when you and I can communicate and we can communicate with all our friends out there that listen to this, it's a, like we get to build relationships quickly. And I love podcasts. It's changed my life. And I really do mean it. People should reach out and make these. This is an engaging conversation, not a, not a show or just a one-way thing or it doesn't work, right? So um, yeah. I'm here to engage with people and here to offer up more opportunities to help think this through. Um, I'm going to be involved in a few panels in the next few weeks, I guess, on our website at uh, weareblacksheep.org. Again, there'll be some announcements there. I'd love to love for people to participate. And, and uh, yeah, so I'm here. 
I think now you are the person who's been on the show the most number of times, but I always enjoy our conversations and everything that we talk about. So thanks for sitting down with me again and, you know, have another chat. I really enjoy and love permaculture to the core, and I love communicating with people about it. Uh, it's, it seems to be my calling in this world, so I really appreciate it. I love, I love your community and the permaculture podcast community, so I'm grateful every time we get to communicate and grateful that it works now that I'm in the States and I have a phone that works. And, and uh, I look forward to hearing from people uh, out there and continue this conversation. And that was Joshua Hughes. Find out more about the team and products from Rewild Organics at rewildorganics.org. To learn more about the history of their work on creating a regenerative supply chain, I've linked to our earlier conversations about black sheep regenerative resource management, permaculture and politics, and Verd Energia in the show notes. There you'll also find links to their other organizations. Did you enjoy this conversation and would like to continue the discussion? Would you like access to weekly updates, monthly AMAs, and the community Discord? Join the Permaculture Podcast community at patreon.com slash permaculturepodcast. Until the next time, spend each day supporting the people and products you believe in while taking care of Earth, yourself, and each other.